Dr. Neil Saunders is our next speaker. He's Assistant Professor of Surgery in the Division of General and GI Surgery in the Department of Surgery at Emory University School of Medicine. He's also the Program Director for the Emory uh, Endocrine Surgery Fellowship. Dr. Saunders received his uh, MD from the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago. He completed his general surgery residency at Emory, followed by a complex general surgical oncology fellowship at Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Today, he'll, he will be speaking to us about management of low risk thyroid cancer. Good morning, everyone. My name is Neil Saunders. I'm one of the uh, surgical oncologists at Emory, specializing in thyroid and endocrine surgery. And I'm also the uh, program director of the Endocrine Surgery Fellowship. I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me here today to speak to you on uh, low-risk thyroid cancer management. I have no relevant financial disclosure to conflicts of interests. So briefly, we'll talk about the historical, historical perspectives and paradigms of thyroid cancer management, and then we'll define our low-risk thyroid cancers and what that really means. Talk about perhaps lobectomy is enough uh, and the increasing use of active surveillance. We'll talk about future directions at the end. So as you know, thyroid cancer is one of the fastest growing malignancies in the United States in terms of incidence, um, and now it's the fifth most common cancer in women. This has been mostly driven by papillary thyroid cancer, however, follicular thyroid cancer has shown an uptick as well. When we look at the annual percent change in mortality uh, over the last uh, 20 years, you see that there is an actual annual increase uh, in percent change in papillary as well as uh, the uh, smaller sizes of papillary as well. This increase in mortality indicates that not only are we seeing more thyroid cancer because we're picking it up with surveillance, there actually is an increased incidence within the population. Now, fortunately, most of the thyroid cancer that we see is the differentiated thyroid cancers, the papillary and follicular variants. Um, and most patients, fortunately, present at stage one uh, with uh, some at two uh, and a small amount of three or four as well. So our past paradigms were for thyroid cancers greater than a centimeter, total thyroidectomy plus or minus central neck lymph node dissection, uh, and then plus or minus adjuvant radioiodine therapy. And we can see through the 80s and 90s, total thyroidectomy for papillary thyroid cancers greater than a centimeter became more and more prevalent. And in 2007, uh, when Carl Bellamoria and his group published their analysis of the NCDB database from 1985 to 1998, uh, they showed that there was a slight improvement in overall survival in patients with papillary thyroid cancer who had undergone a total thyroidectomy. And this carried over to recurrence rates as well. There was a slightly improved or sort of slightly decreased uh, risk of recurrence uh, in the total thyroidectomy patients in that group. And so in 2009, when the ATA guidelines were released, uh, recommendation 26 said that for patients with thyroid cancers greater than a centimeter, the, in, the initial surgical procedure should be a near total or total thyroidectomy. And at that time, they recommended a lobectomy for small, less than one centimeter, low risk cancers. Now, while that uh, guideline was being uh, published, there were groups uh, accumulating data that showing that perhaps less surgical stent um, for low-risk cancers uh, would serve our patients better. And so why would we want to limit our surgical stent? There's obvious reasons. Decreased complication rate. Even though in high-volume centers, the risk of uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is less than 1%, and the risk of permanent hypoparathyroidism is, is 1% or less, um, decreasing the extent of surgery if it's not necessary is, is a good idea. And additionally, leaving half of the thyroid behind will decrease the number of patients who need levothyroxine. And as more and more data comes out uh, showing that these patients who don't need thyroid supplementation uh, may have improved uh, quality of life, uh, this is a meaningful goal as well. And so before we go any further, I'd like to kind of define what we mean by low-risk thyroid, differentiated thyroid cancer. Uh, so in 2016, when the ATA, 2015 ATA guidelines came out, uh, they had this modified risk stratification system dividing uh, patients' thyroid cancer into low, intermediate, and high-risk cancers. The low risk uh, comprise these lower 10, uh, 10 categories, and these mostly include intrathyroidal 
less than four centimeter uh, thyroid cancers without aggressive features, meaning no, not, no tall cell variants or hobnail variants, uh, no extrathyroidal extension. Um, and these cancers are within the thyroid, not, not at the edge or not invading into any of the surrounding structures. The intermediate and high risk uh, categories are beyond uh, the scope of this talk this morning, uh, but they are listed here as well. And so fortunately, most patients who present with thyroid cancer uh, will have a low risk thyroid cancer. And this data out of Italy from the Thyroid Cancer Observation Group uh, showed that 54% of patients uh, on initial presentation will have low risk thyroid cancer. And so lobectomy for differentiated thyroid cancer in the United States uh, has really been spearheaded by the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Group. Uh, and this is their publication from 2012 uh, looking at 889 patients with T1 or T2 lesions uh, that were intrathyroidal, um, and 361 of these patients underwent uh, thyroid lobectomy. With a mean follow-up of just a little over eight years, their 10-year disease-specific survival was 99%, and their recurrence-free survival was 98%. They noted no difference between local recurrence for total thyroidectomy or thyroid lobectomy. This is a table from their, uh, their publication, and these last five lines show that in their lobectomy group, uh, they really had no local recurrence, no distant recurrence, um, and then no disease-specific deaths. And there were similar data out of uh, Japan as well. Uh, this study involving nearly 1,100 patients uh, going from the mid-80s to mid-90s uh, for low-risk uh, uh, thyroid cancer showed that um, that if you excluded aggressive histologies, that the chance of having recurrences in the contralateral lobe were very low. Now, when they looked at disease-specific survival with all these lobectomy patients in Japan, they noted that things that were associated with uh, decreased survival were age greater than 45 uh, in the top middle, and then extrathyroidal extension in the left lower, uh, left lower box. Uh, and then also tumor size greater than four centimeters. And in addition to this, uh, data came out around in a similar time showing that in patients who had low risk uh, differentiated thyroid cancer, that radioiodine ablation after a total thyroidectomy uh, did not improve disease-free survival, indicating that uh, the radioiodine ablation in these patients uh, was likely uh, not uh, effective and that um, perhaps the patients could have uh, had an a similar outcome with a, a thyroid lobectomy rather than a total thyroidectomy and radioiodine ablation. An additional database studies, including SEER database uh, review, showed similar outcomes. Uh, when stratified by AIMS criteria, the uh, publication by Hagedal showed that there was no difference in uh, survival. Uh, similarly, disease, 10 year disease specific survival uh, was the same between lobectomy and total thyroidectomy uh, in this other analysis. Uh, and then in 2014, Julianne Sosa and her group published an NCDB analysis that was essentially the next decade beyond the Bill of Moria paper. So this was 1998 to 2006, looking at these small uh, one to four centimeter. Uh, papillary thyroid cancers, and uh, about 6,800 of these patients underwent a lobectomy. And again, they excluded the aggressive variants and any patients who had extrathyroidal extension. In a multivariate analysis, the extent of surgery was not statistically significant predictor of overall survival. And interestingly, factors that were also not significant were extrathyroidal extension and multifocality, although those have been shown in previous papers to um, decrease overall survival. And this is a table from their paper uh, showing that things that were negatively correlated with overall survival were older patient age, nodal metastasis, distant metastasis, and positive surgical margins, as you might expect. And things that were not uh, correlated with the decreased overall survival were surgical extent, represented here by the total thyroidectomy line, or extrathyroidal extension or multifocality. And so taking all this data um, together, the 2015 ATA guidelines, recommendation 35, they recommended that for tumors between one and four centimeters uh, without uh, extrathyroidal extension lymph node metastasis could be treated with either a bilateral 
total bilaterectomy or a unilateral uh, lobectomy. They also mentioned in that recommendation that thyroid lobectomy alone might be sufficient for uh, initial treatment for low risk papillary and thyroid cancers. So did these recommendations change practice? Well, this uh, paper published earlier this year uh, from the Harvard group looked at the IBM market scan commercial database um, for uh, US thyroidectomies. And there were 220 thyroidectomies uh, from 2007, 2018. Um, these included benign indications as well. But you can see in 2015, there was a pretty stark drop off in the proportion of total thyroidectomies done. Um, and this is also reflected in the CISQIP data. And CISQIP is a quality improvement database uh, maintained by the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, which is a uh, surgeon reported uh, outcomes and, um, and procedures. And you can see, again, in 2015, a pretty stark uh, or pretty significant drop uh, from the proportion of total thyroidectomy compared to thyroid lobectomy. And so since the 2015 guidelines, essentially the next group of NCDB data has been um, been analyzed uh, the next decade from 2004 to 2014. Uh, again, these smaller thyroid cancers. And in this paper published last year, uh, they compared what appropriate thyroid lobectomy versus inappropriate thyroid lobectomy and the outcomes uh, of these. And they considered an inappropriate thyroid lobectomy if the patient ended up having high risk features um, and they had lobectomy as their definitive treatment. Um, and these high risk features were clinical positive lymph nodes, positive margins, extrathyroidal extension, lymphovascular evasion. And when they looked at the patients who had appropriate thyroid lobectomy, meaning they didn't have any of these high risk features versus the inappropriate, you could see that when uh, matched propensity score matched, uh, there was a small but statistically significant uh, decrease in survival at five and 10 years as a patient underwent an inappropriate thyroid lobectomy. And then they compared the inappropriate thyroid lobectomy who, to the group of patients who actually had a total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine or what you would think of as appropriate therapy, or appropriate therapy for an intermediate high-risk cancer. And the same thing, there was a small but um, statistically significant uh, decrease in five and 10 year overall survival if they had an inappropriate uh, thyroid lobectomy. And so in well-selected patients, uh, the data seems to indicate that uh, thyroid lobectomy for a low risk thyroid cancer uh, may, be, uh, may be enough. And so now we'll move on to non-operative management. So are there a group of patients with low risk thyroid cancer who can be managed non-operatively? Now, essentially in the 2015 guidelines, we already have a non-operative arm. Um, if you look at the FNA criteria for biopsy thyroid nodules, the less than one uh, centimeter thyroid nodules, there are, very, there are rare indications for doing those uh, needle biopsies. So essentially we're already non-operatively managing some of these small thyroid cancers because we're not fna them in the, uh, the United States. Now, active surveillance was pioneered uh, in Japan, uh, Kuma Hospital by Kira Miyauchi uh, and colleagues. They started doing this in uh, 1993. Uh, they started an ongoing clinical trial comparing surgery to observation of these small, less than one centimeter uh, papillary thyroid cancers. Now in Japan, as opposed to here, they biopsy any uh, lesion that's, any concerning lesion that's bigger than five millimeters uh, in the thyroid, rather than the one centimeter that we use here. And their, their largest paper published was from 2016 with uh, 2000, a little over 2,000 patients enrolled, uh, 1,100 in the active surveillance, uh, and 900 I should chose, uh, 974 shows immediate surgery. Uh, but in the active surveillance group, only 94 of them uh, ever ended up converting to surgery. Uh, most of them were patient preference, uh, but 27 of them were due to tumor enlargement, which we're gonna define an active surveillance ongoing as greater than three millimeters of an enlargement. Uh, six, of pa six patients had lymph node metastasis. And in this group of nearly a thousand patients, they had no dis disease specific mortality and no distant metastasis. Um, and actually due to the earlier data from this group uh, in 2010, the Japan Society of Thyroid Surgery actually accepted non-surgical observation as management of these low risk uh, papillary thyroid cancers. 
And there are, there are multiple sites around the world that have been uh, engaged in similar trials, most of them in Asia. Um, the Kuma Hospital in Japan, uh, Cancer Institute in Japan, and then there's a multi-center South Korea group. But down at the bottom of this, the one uh, American lo location that has been kind of at the front of this is Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and their initial paper looking at low risk, less than 1.5 centimeter papillary thyroid cancers um, had uh, uh, showed pretty good outcomes with a, a small uh, rate of growth enlargement of only 12% um, at, uh, at five years. And from that Tuttle paper, from the, the Mike Tuttle's group at Memorial, one of the interesting uh, tables from their, from their paper is actually showing the change in size of uh, cancers under active surveillance. Uh, now, obviously, because you know we're measuring spheres, the volume increases very quickly uh, compared to the uh, the diameter of the radius. So, something going from six millimeters to nine millimeters, while it's, while it's only a three millimeter increase in size, it's actually a three hundred percent increase in volume. Uh, and so, if you look at all the nodules that they were following, uh, you can see that a little bit less than half, or about forty percent of them, actually got smaller uh, over time. And of course, there is a uh, a group on the end where they had significant increases. And so who's at risk for having this disease progression? Um, this is uh, data from uh, Japan again. Uh, they looked at 1,200 patients who were in their uh, observation program. And disease progression defined as a tumor enlargement greater than three millimeters or uh, nodal metastasis uh, was followed for these patients and broken down by age group. And you can see the patients who were at the highest risk of this were really younger patients, the patients in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And as the patients got older, there was less risk of disease progression, which is a little bit counterintuitive because we usually think of uh, more aggressive thyroid cancer being uh, associated with older patients. Uh, but for following these small uh, papillary, or sorry, uh, uh, micropapillary cancers, it's actually the younger patients that are at higher risk for uh, progression. And so last year, there was a nice meta-analysis uh, published uh, looking at nine studies worldwide and a little over 4,000 patients. Seven of the studies used uh, for this analysis actually used a 10 millimeter size criteria uh, to, to put, place patients into active surveillance. And two of them used 15 millimeters, including the, uh, the memorial group. And again, they divide, define tumor growth as greater than or equal to three millimeters. And these patients were all followed along with Q Q6 month or Q12 month uh, examinations and ultrasounds. And the pooled mean length of follow-up was just a little bit over four years. And when you, when you looked at tumor growth um, and metastasis to cervical lymph nodes, you can see that the proportion is actually very low. Term, tumor growth pooled together was about 4.4% and nodal spread only about 1%. And all these 4,000 patients, only nine, a little under 10%, uh, underwent uh, delayed thyroid surgery, and 1% had uh, recurrence after that surgery. And so, you know, I know what you're thinking, uh, how am I going to randomize or how am I going to put patients into an observation arm when they have um, thyroid cancer? Um, that was an initial hesitation within uh, the patients in the Japan uh, study as well. Initially, when they first started doing this in the 90s, only about 30% of their patients opted for active surveillance. And now they report that it's actually over 90% of their patients with these small, less than one centimeter cancers actually enroll in the active surveillance program. Um, this study from the Harvard group was a patient, uh, patient survey of thyroid cancer survivors, and they distributed this to the thyroid cancer, uh, various thyroid cancer advocacy, advocacy groups. Um, they, they, look, they questioned 1,500 patients um, most of whom had undergone a total thyroidectomy uh, and most of whom had undergone radioactive iodine. And they asked them if cancer outcomes were the same, would they have chosen lobectomy? And only 39% of these patients on their survey said that they would actually rather have a lobectomy than a total thyroidectomy. And only 35% of the patients would have considered observation for their thyroid cancer. And, and most interestingly, 50% uh, of the respondents uh, said they would actually have the resources that, that would allow them to actually enroll in the observation arm and come back for these every six to 12 month um, 
ultrasounds. Um, you know, the, a lot of this data has been from Japan and Korea, and both of those countries have universal healthcare systems set up. Um, and so in the United States, it's a little bit more burdensome for on patients uh, financially uh, to undergo these active surveillance programs. Um, and so just right off the get-go, only about half of these patients would have, uh, would have been eligible for it. And so who is who would be a good candidate for active surveillance? So in 2016, uh, Brito et al. published this nice table um, showing who would be an ideal, appropriate, or inappropriate uh, selection for active surveillance. And so the ideal candidate, you know, have a solitary thyroid nodule with well-defined margins surrounded by normal thyroid parenchyma, uh, something that's going to be at a low risk for having extra thyroid extension or metastasizing. Uh, and these patients would preferentially be older given that they're going to have a lower rate of disease progression. And the biggest thing would be they're going to be expected to be compliant with follow-up. Uh, we wouldn't want them to be, you know, come in for their initial ultrasound, sign up for active surveillance, and then essentially never come back. Now, medical team characteristics, you do want to have this at an experienced center with good ultrasounds. Um, if you're in a rural, rural setting and without a good um, infrastructure set up to follow these patients, it may not be um, a good... Um, endeavor to undertake surveilling these patients. So future directions. So right now we use molecular markers uh, mostly for Bethesda 3 and 4 uh, nodules, um, particularly the follicular lesions who we can't preoperatively diagnose cancer versus a benign nodule. These uh, molecular markers like uh, thyroseq, Affirma, and Thygen X can be used to help identify mutations that will put these patients at high or low risk for an aggressive cancer, or maybe it's a benign nodule and we don't need to do any surgery. Um, but what if we actually use these molecular markers for known cancers, Bethesda 6, um, and use that to help um, determine our extent of surgery? So this is uh, the, the patient management um, kind of algorithm for the current testing for Bethesda 3 and 4. And as you can see, you know, the Patients with RAS-like mutations in the middle uh, have had the most risk for a low-risk cancer, and we typically will manage them with lobectomy. Uh, and the patients with high-risk mutations, like uh, like TERT or, or other high-risk mutations, will preferentially perform total thyroidectomies up front um, if they initially started as a Bethesda three and four. Now, the group uh, the group from McGill University in Montreal actually correlated their um, mutational analysis from these molecular markers with their final pathology uh, um, on the thyroid specimens and looked to see if there was any correlation between the high risk features and these higher risk mutations. And that's exactly what they found was that the BRAF, TERT, and RET mutations were, had the highest percentage of having extra thyroid extension, lymph node positivity, tall cell variants, hobnail variants, other high risk features. And the other mutations had significantly lower risk of having these features. And then they actually started using this um, on their um, Bethesda 6, uh, 5 and 6 uh, thyroid nodules to determine their extent of surgery. Um, and so they actually enrolled 122 patients, 86 of which had pre-surgical molecular testing and uh, 36 did not. And they used both Thygenex and Thyroseq. And based on the final pathology from the patient, did the patient actually receive the optimal surgery? They defined optimal surgery as having total thyroidectomy in the cases with the high risk features, the extra thyroid extension, positive lymph nodes, and then lobectomy would be a, the optimal surgery if they didn't have any of those. And what they found was that 92% of the patients with molecular testing had optimal surgery, but only 61% of the control group did. And interestingly, 24% of the molecular testing group actually had their extent of surgery changed. Um, Two thirds of these patients had their surgery upgraded to a total thyroidectomy, and about a third of them actually had it decreased down to a thyroid lobectomy. So just briefly, I'd like to talk about RFA for papillary thyroid cancers. We're using it more for benign lesions now. There's very limited data for this, um, most of which has been come out in the last two years. And they're limited to single series, single center series, uh, like this one from Korea. Uh, which showed a disappearance rate of 98% of less than one uh, centimeter papillary thyroid cancers that they were ablating. Uh, some of them did need repeat RFAs, um, but they noted no local tumor progression and no delayed surgery in this group. The complication rate was about 1.4%. 
And this is similar to other data uh, from other institutions. This study out of Korea uh, with 152 biopsy proven papillary thyroid, uh, small papillary thyroid cancers, 91% rate of complete disappearance uh, with the low complication rates. Um, and similar data, similar study out of China. The summation of the literature uh, published earlier this year uh, show, with 1,400 patients undergoing RFA uh, showed a complete disappearance rate of anywhere from 33 to 100%, uh, a low rate of tumor progression, and again, a low rate of complication. There's very little data on cancer bigger than a centimeter for RFA, and there's basically minimal to no data on uh, follicular thyroid cancers. So in the future, what, what is ongoing as far as clinical trials? There are multiple sites for active surveillance trials uh, in the US and Canada, particularly at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and they've actually increased their uh, size of cancers eligible to go under active surveillance up to two centimeters. And I've actually seen a, um, a 2.5 centimeter um, uh, trial uh, proposal as well. Um, Cedar sinai uh, has a similar program as well as the University of Toronto. And the RFA uh, for micropapillary thyroid cancer is really in its infancy at this point. There's a pilot study at Mayo, um, and MD Anderson is not yet enrolling their, their uh, patients. So conclusions, thyroid lobectomy is likely adequate uh, for low risk, one to four centimeter low risk uh, differentiated thyroid cancers. Uh, but appropriately defining what is low risk is key. Uh, other patient factors and preferences may influence surgical extent, uh, such as uh, multinodularity or patient anxiety. Um, but in well-selected patients, this is likely enough for these low-risk cancers. And active surveillance can be appropriate in well-selected patients with small, low-risk uh, papillary thyroid cancers, particularly the older patients who are going to be and patients who are going to be compliant with follow-up. In the future, we'll have more personalized medicine. We'll probably use more molecular markers to help define the extent, and there will probably be an expanded non-surgical therapy choices as well. Thank you uh, for your time and attention, and with that, I'll take any questions.